What's up everybody, welcome back to the show. In this video, I wanna take a look at what is probably one of the most important photography monographs ever produced. And of course, this is Henri Cartier-Bresson's The Decisive Moment. This was produced in the early 1950s, and this version is actually the reissue version that Steidl did earlier this year. Steidl, I think, is one of the most important um, book publishers for photography monographs around today. They're doing some wonderful work historically and with contemporary photographers, and they did the reissue of The Decisive Moment, which in its original pressing only had 10,000 copies, and it is really hard to find now, so I think it's really cool that Steidl reissued this. The reissue is fantastic, and what I want to do in this video today is take a look at this and show you guys um, I, what I believe makes this book, as Robert Kappa called it, a Bible for photographers, and it really is impressive and quite amazing. Um, the book comes with the original Matisse artwork. It, it kind of looks like it did when it was originally released. And it comes actually in two parts. Uh, when you take the slipcase off, you get the reissue of the book. And uh, that's this part right here. And then you also get this little you know, pamphlet book, which is uh, sort of behind the scenes. And I think in a lot of ways, it's really cool because it acts as a little bit of a linchpin um, in terms of understanding the importance of this book and learning a lot of behind the scenes about it too, which actually is quite fascinating. The book came about as a collaboration. Henri Cartier-Bresson had attempted to do several books prior to this, this book's release. In fact, there was a project with uh, Jean Cocteau that never was realized, and there were two others. And then finally, The Decisive Moment was the first one that actually came about. And it began, well, the whole book is largely a collaboration among a bunch of people. But the book actually initially was a collaboration between Cartier-Bresson and a French designer who went by the name Thériade. Uh, Thériade is seen in this photo here holding up the, um, the original artwork, and I'll talk about some of this in a minute. Now, Thériade had been publishing a magazine called Verve, which was an art publication at the time. And Henri Cartier-Bresson had a really interesting career in that he he moved between the world of photojournalism, which was, he was firmly committed to, and also the world of fine art. And in Henri Cartier-Bresson's own words, and you hear a lot of people who are hardcore street photographers um, say this, but essentially photographs Yes, they are reproduced as prints, and prints hanging in a gallery are interesting, but more important to him was the magazine work that he was doing because it was more widely accessible to people. You didn't have to go into an exhibition to see it. Remember, this is way before the internet. And more so than a magazine, he felt that there was a permanence in books that felt more like a permanent exhibition of work. So he was really into the idea of doing a book. He felt that magazines, as important as they were for distribution purposes, ended up in the trash bin most of the time, whereas a book was meant to be saved and kept and it ended up acting as a bit of a permanent exhibition. And so anyway, he had done some work in the Verve magazine with uh, Thierry Ad, and he was approached by Thierry Ad about producing a monograph, which ended up becoming the decisive moment. Um, Matisse, the cover on this is really interesting too, and I'll talk about that for a second. It goes into great detail in here. But Matisse, you have to understand, I don't know if you guys can see this, I'm gonna hold it up so you can you can see it a little better. Um, but this is an image of Thierry Ad holding up the original cover, and you can kind of see in this um, how paste up works. And of course, this was the days before we did publishing on a computer, and paste up was a way of actually pasting things together life size in what was ultimately going to become the final book design. And so the lines you see of the paper crossing, you know, are not are not there in the final reproduction, but that is actually the mock-up of the cover which was used. And what's interesting about this is Matisse was chosen for this, which is pretty bold on several levels. First of all, this is a photography monograph, so we're having a famous artist do the cover. And the real reason of why that decision was made um, by Thierry Ad was that he and Richard Simon from Simon & Schuster felt that having Matisse do the cover, Matisse had done several monographs that were very popular, and having him do the cover possibly gave it a little more sales appeal. Matisse worked in a style that, of gauche paper cutouts, where literally he would draw with a, a pair of scissors and actually cut out these elements and paste them on here. And Matisse that was a you know, major hallmark of his style. The Matisse estate is quoted in this introduction to the book as saying the representative elements here are, this would be the sun up in the upper right-hand corner, a mountain range in the left-hand corner, a bird with something, a branch in his mouth, and then you just have kind of these vegetative figures down here, and the rectangle could possibly represent water or a lake or something of that nature. I think what's also cool about this is in Matisse's own handwriting, he went out and titled the book and photography by Henri Cartier-Bresson. It is also interesting that a lot of people uh, point out the omission of the hyphen in Cartier-Bresson. 
And this is overanalyzed quite a bit. I think what it comes down to is if you are a book editor, you do not send back work to Matisse to correct. That's just simply not done. So anyway, it's kind of interesting. Anyway, a lot of people have made comments on this. In fact, the photographer Minor White uh, mentioned that the photographer, or that the cover here was actually just as delightful as it was inappropriate for a photography monograph. But needless to say, that that's where the work on the cover comes up. Also interesting about this is they talk about the titling of the book, and I think this is kind of key too because you know Cartier-Bresson used that term, the decisive moment, and we often associate that term with Cartier-Bresson, but that was not the original working title of the book. In fact, there is a section in here, and I'll hold this up so you can see it. This is a, a typed version that, that Cartier-Bresson did himself of all the possible book titles on this. And they're all, or most of them in different ways, are trying to describe uh, his style of working. And in fact, one of the ideas was this whole idea of tiptoeing. Um, in French, it's a pas de loup, um, and meaning the way that you would carefully bring the camera into a situation trying not to be observed or trying not to let what's going on be influenced by the fact that it's being photographed, which I thought was interesting. The French version, there are actually two versions of this book. The one that was released in France was titled Image à la Souvette, which doesn't translate very well into English. It literally means images on the sly, which, you know, it, like many expressions in French and in English, they don't match up very well. They sound very strange, actually, when you translate them. So, Bresson was having a hard time with this, and eventually, he found a quote from Cardinal de Retz, and it talks about it in here, that was published posthumously in 1717, where he went on to say, there is nothing in this world that does not bear a decisive moment. And I think at that point, Bresson realized that this is the correct title uh, for the English version of this book. So it was ended up, the English version was called The Decisive Moment. I find this really interesting because it really does explain the style he was going for. Um, it talks about in here how Bresson was trying to come up with an analogy for, I love this, it's very poetic, is you know the moment that the police show up to ask the street vendors to show their licenses and everybody flees. You're going to get this wonderful expression of, of, of being startled. That would be the decisive moment before they're all gone. Anyway, it's, it's quite poetic. In the art world and in the photography world, people fell in love with this book when it came out. It was really very different than anything that had come before its time. And you have to realize in the 1950s, this was a massive book to be produced. Um, and so it was really bold um, in terms of publication of how they went about this. The whole thing with Matisse doing the cover and then this wonderful collection of Bresson's images that also included text, which we're going to discuss. Unfortunately, it did not sell very well. In fact, I mentioned there were 10,000 copies initially printed of this book. There were 3,000 of the French edition with the images uh, de la, à la souvette, and then the American version of The Decisive Moment only had 7,000 copies printed. So it was a very rare book, and it did not sell well. In fact, um, it, Simon Schuster were going to pick up a second edition of this, and it didn't happen uh, just because of the poor sales, which is unfortunate. A lot of the text in here has been reprinted since then in many times in many different publications, and of course the images can be found elsewhere. Um, real quick, before we get into the second part of this book, I do want to mention our sponsor today and thank them because without them, this show would not happen. They allow me to produce these videos. So I want to give a special shout out to the folks at lynda.com. If you're not familiar with lynda.com, they offer a probably, I think, one of the most concise resources for video training tutorials that you're going to find anywhere. It is a subscription-based service. I've been a member of them for years, uh, way before I had um, you know, sponsorship from them. In fact, they offered me a free account. I still pay for it because I think Linda are worth paying for. Anyway, if you're interested in learning anything about book publication, uh, so if you're interested in InDesign or Illustrator or even Photoshop or PrePress or any of that stuff, there are a lot of wonderful titles in Linda's massive library that you probably will find very useful on this. Uh, particularly color correction and preparing stuff for print is particularly excellent and they've got a lot of wonderful titles in there. Lynda.com have a deal right now for Art of Photography viewers right now where you can get 10 days of unlimited access absolutely free and what you want to do is you want to go to the following link. You want to go to lynda.com slash AOP. That is Lynda with a Y. Lynda.com slash AOP. That lets Lynda know that I sent you and you're going to get 10 days of unlimited access absolutely free and so I want to give a special shout out and thanks once again to the folks 
folks at lynda.com for sponsoring another episode of The Art of Photography. I wanna talk for a little bit about the decisive moment as a book and why it's such an important document in the history of photography. Uh, what's particularly interesting is just about everything in here holds up. Nothing feels very dated. This could have been published yesterday and everything is for the most part still relevant. Um, it's a very interesting book. It is largely the pacing of the images in here is largely chronological and basically put into two sections. There are 63 images which span a total of 68 pages. You have a couple two-page spreads and it's divided into two parts. The first part of the book are images largely taken, um, you know, being chronological earlier in Europe and the second part of the book is contains images that were taken in the Orient and so various countries including India and China. And the, the monograph, most of these pictures you're probably familiar with. Um, this book has been repurposed. As I mentioned, it didn't sell well on its own early on, even though it was highly respected in the art world. Um, most of these images are classic images, very famous, that are easy to find in other publications today. And having said that, what I think is interesting is how this works as a book. And you have a preface in here that was written by Cartier-Bresson himself. In fact, Cartier-Bresson wasn't crazy about writing about technique and his purpose. And Richard Simon from the publisher wanted a technical document to accompany the book for photographers. And they were kind of a little bit in disagreement of how that was going to work. And in the end, it ended up that um, Cartier-Bresson worked with an editor and did this first section, which is extremely important, I think, is, and this is what makes it a Bible of photography. And in the end, in the very last section, you do see Richard Simon had this written and it was published only in the English version of this, but it's a technical report to photographers. This part is a little bit dated and, it, you know, in all fairness, it really wasn't part of Cartier-Bresson's uh, original vision. But this talks a lot about black and white film, D76, and the importance of using Omega enlargers. And it's just a little bit more of a dated uh, technical perspective uh, written by uh, Richard L. Simon himself. But the first part of this is what's extremely important. And Bresson gives you a brief overview in here, and this has been republished several times, but it's a brief overview of you know, how he b became interested in photography, um, what got him started with the camera, and then it goes into his aesthetic, and this is where it gets extremely important. He talks about um, the picture story and what actually is a photographic reportage, a picture story. Sometimes there is one unique picture whose composition possesses vigor and richness, whose content so radiates onward from it that this is single picture is worth a whole story in itself and he really talks um, somewhat poetically but also very practically about his method of making images the important part that it comes into where he talks about the subject he talks about composition and I have covered Bresson on this show before in terms of composition it was pretty early on it's been a while and then I also used Bresson's images when I talked about geometry and composition in a series that I did probably about two years ago, which I would really love to update and because I think they could be done a little bit better now. And I'll come back to that later, but um, one of the things that I always get is response from people, whether it be comments, or I've actually had people email me um, when we start to get into angles, geometry, leading lines, and they say, well, you're just drawing triangles on there. There's no way the photographer could have considered that or thought about it. And we do know that Cartier-Bresson was classically trained as a visual artist. But he actually states in here the importance of geometry in composition. And I think the important part in here and the important takeaway is what Bresson teaches us right from his own pen. And he says under composition, if a photograph is to communicate its subject in all its intensity, the relationship of form must be rigorously established. Photography implies the recognition of a rhythm in the world of real things. What the eye does is to find and focus on the particular subject within the mass of reality. What the camera does is simply to register upon film the decision made by the eye. So I think in many ways, yes, there are geometric elements and there are, um, there are basically guidelines that, that make sense out of chaos and that's what composition is. There are relationships between things in the picture. And these relationships are important. There are ways that you lead the eye through, and these are very important in telling your story. What Cartier-Bresson is saying in this last sentence, where upon the final decision made by the eye, is that it ultimately, you learn these things and then you have to follow through based on gut reactions, and that's where the photographer comes into play. He even goes on to say that, you know, even when you're using the golden rule here, um, the last thing you would ever want to do is etch that into the ground glass on a camera or make that a guideline for people to follow. The other thing that I'm, I'm to mention before I wrap this up here is when, when Cartier-Bresson's talking about technique, and I think this is really interesting too, he talks about an obsession 
that photographers have, and this would have been mid-century 1950s, of, you know, sharpness in a shot and, you know, the technique involved in the darkroom and getting too wrapped up in this thinking that that is going to make a great image. And he said, this is just as silly, and I'll have to put this in a little bit of historical context, but the last paragraph, and, and he says, um, I am constantly amused by the notion that some people have about a photo photographic technique, a notion which reveals itself in an insatiable craving for sharpness of images. Is it passion? Is sorry. Is this the passion of an obsession, or do these people hope by this trompe d'oeil technique to get closer to grips with reality? In either case, they are just as far away from the real problem as those that the older generation, which used to endow all of its photography antidotes with an intentional unsharpness, such as what would be deemed to be artistic. And what he's referring to is pictorialism, which was largely prominent right before um, Cartier-Bresson's generation, where there was this obsession with uh, really shallow depth of field and a blurriness of an image to somehow make that more painterly. And what Bresson is telling us in here is that when you get obsessed with a specific technique, you're moving away from the determination of what makes an image really magical and what tells a story. And I think that that's really important. The last thing I want to wrap this up on, right before you get into the images, um, is a little pull quote. He says, "Where these photographs taken at random by a wandering camera do not in any way attempt to give a general picture of any of the countries to which that camera has been at large. And I think this is a really interesting poetic way of putting this. Of course, he is acknowledging that these are exotic locations by saying, don't pay attention to that. But I think he's reinforcing his point is that the story of an image is not dependent on location. It's not dependent on anything but the people you're photographing and the subjects and the story you're telling. And I think that's such a beautiful way of expressing that, even though we all know Henri Cartier-Bresson is this great magnum photographer who traveled the world and did these just amazing feats of photojournalism. Anyway, the images are amazing in here. The print job on this is outstanding. Now, here is the burning question here. Would I recommend you track down a copy of The Decisive Moment? And it all depends. Um, the Decisive Moment exists as a document at a specific point in time that has an extreme importance associated with it. Having said that, just about all these images have been reproduced in other publications. In fact, there is another book that I would recommend, uh, which is a retrospective. This Henri Cartier-Bresson, The Man, the Image, and the World. The Man, the Image, and the World which is much more complete in terms of what is in here and the photography that's included. Um, the beautiful introduction that I'm going on so much about, which I think is just so important because it's really, um, you know, shows us into the mind of the photographer. This has been republished on occasions. In fact, what's also interesting, and the, the pamphlet tells us about this too, is there was a section that was left out where there was actually a geometrical um, analysis by Brisson of his own work. I'll show this to you here. So, um, you know, that's what he was thinking. And this was actually omitted and retuned into this. Um, Schuster had asked for that, but said, no, no, I want a very technical. And so that's why he wrote the thing at the end about developer and enlargers which is interesting because I don't think Bresson is really renowned as a printer as much as he was just an amazing photographer. Um, usually he had third parties do his printing. But anyway, so would I recommend this? Well, if you were interested in this book as a historical document, it is wonderful to revisit. I pull it off the shelf. I bought it last summer and I can't tell you how much enjoyment I've gotten out of this. I think Steidl did such a great job. To me, there is just kind of a classic aura of this book. Um, it's already getting hard to find. As I'm not sure that if they're going to print another um, run of the reissue or not. Um, it will hold its value if you feel like you want to invest in something like this. In fact, it probably will go up in value, probably not as much as if you had an original copy of The Decisive Moment. But it is a wonderful book, and so your mileage is just going to vary as to whether or not this is something that you see in your collection. For me, it was essential, but I think if you're just interested in Cartier-Bresson's essays or photos, there are other places that you can find those as well, which may be a little less, um, a little easier on your wallet, if you know what I mean. But anyway, that's about all I've got for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and uh, leave a comment below if you have any thoughts on this. And uh, until the next time, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Later.